Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by Cashfly at Cashfly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, episode 61, One Heartbeat Away. This episode of Futures in Biotech is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com forward slash biotech. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there to be the extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapy? Ballpark, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that might be rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun is the center of the universe, so this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. Well, welcome to Futures of Biotech. Uh, this is Mark Pelletier speaking. And um, we've got a really uh, experimental show today. Um, one of the things, one of the topics I've been avoiding is uh, the, the biotechnology of the heart. Uh, there's been incredible amounts of advancement in our understanding of the human heart and our ability to fix it, you know, with drugs, through pharmacology, through genetics, through surgery. And, you know, we're one heartbeat away <laughs> from death. And that scares me. <laughs> so I've avoided uh, doing any uh, cardiovascular or heart biotech shows um, for a long time. And since we're approaching our fourth year anniversary, uh, which is on June 14th, um, I thought maybe it's about time we tackle the hard stuff. And this is going to be a hardcore biotech show. Um, I've brought on uh, a young professor. His name's Julian Stelzer. He's a brand new professor at the assistant, uh, uh, brand new assistant professor in physiology and biophysics at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, welcome, Julian. Hey, Mark. Nice to be here with you. Um, one of the, th I had this idea, and he's doing it on very, very short notice. I had the idea that, well, you know, Julian's one of the smartest guys I know. And I thought, well, if he could come and explain a little bit of the biotech, around, uh, you know, so, some his field, basically. explain, Get us introduced into his field. Then perhaps we could do some follow-up shows throughout the summer and really get a handle uh, uh, of this. I'm going to read, so he picked two papers, but I'm just going to read the, the first little paragraph here of, of one of the papers because it describes really the statistics and the importance of this work, right? It says, heart failure, this is a paper by Shen et al., uh, and it came out, last week in circulation, heart failure, which is one of the top uh, journals in, 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 the, in the field of uh, um, uh, cardiovascular research. And it says, heart failure, the common end stage of most forms of heart disease, afflicted 2.5% of the U.S. population. That's 2.7 million people in 2006. It was the cause of death for almost 300,000 people in 2005. 300,000 people, that's 100 um, September 11th. You know, that's a... Uh, it's an enormous amount of people. And it says the um, NHLBI, which is the National Institute for Lung... Uh, help me out, Julian. <laughs> heart, Lung, and Blood. Okay, National Institute for Heart, Lung, and Blood. Uh, 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 Framing, Framingham study has shown that 80% of men and 70% of women with heart failure under the age of 65 die within eight years. So the total estimate... Uh, the total estimated cost for heart failure in 2009 is $37 billion, right? So this is, uh, isn't heart disease the number one killer? I believe it is, yeah. So heart disease kills, what, one in five? Cancer, one in seven. Stroke, one in 20. So you're basically taking on um, the, our, our number one frailty, Right, human frailty. This is this is the killer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's why I'm terrified every day at work. Right, the responsibility. It's all on your shoulders, <laughs> Julian. So you've done a number of things, and I, I want to start off by, um, uh, you know, you've come to the right place. You've come to Cleveland, 
And uh, the Cleveland Clinic, which is across the street, is the number one heart center in the world, isn't it? Uh, that's what they say, yeah. So you've come into the, to the thick of it um, and, you know, taken on one of the big uh, challenges. And um, there's two things I'd like to, to talk to you about to start off with. What, you, what's your background and how you got into the field? What did you do at the PhD level? How did you, what did you do at the postdoc level? And how did that uh, allow you to step into a faculty position? And, this, and that second part, how did it allow you to step into a faculty position? You know, a lot of, I've gotten a lot of emails asking, how does one go ahead, move forward in, with a career in science? And faculty positions are even more difficult uh, than necessarily the industry, for example. Uh, it's very, very tough to get a faculty position. There's just so few of them, and they're, they're so competitive. I'd like to ask you a little bit about how you uh, managed to get through the, the process, not just because of the fact that you're really smart. But <laughs> what did you do? What was your advantage? Because there's a lot of smart people going for it, and you were very successful at doing it. Um, I know your, your chairman, uh, Walter Boron, who's also my business partner, is on, he was at Yale for 30 years. He's, he's, <laughs> he's really, really tough. And how you got, became his first candidate recruit uh, was, is pretty impressive. So, so welcome to the show. And, and perhaps you could just start off by telling us a little bit about what you did at the PhD level. All right. Yeah. So let's start with cardiac that. Um, I think I have always been interested in uh, how muscle works uh, I didn't really start out necessarily in cardiac muscle, uh, but I was very interested in the way that muscle adapts to different environments, different stresses. Um, for example, uh, you know, starting out in skeletal muscle, you know, the, the most common thing that people look at is, you know, what's the effect of exercise, weight training on on muscle development, things like that. And and when I started doing my PhD work, I I found some interesting applications. Uh, you know, with what's called muscle plasticity or, or how muscle changes with regards to uh, different uh, loading environments. And specifically, at the time, there was great interest in uh, the space program and how uh, effects, uh, you know, how, how would space flight, which, which is in conditions of very low gravity, uh, would affect the, the muscle development and muscle function. So that's kind of why I started out in my PhD level work, um, you know, looking really at the, at the molecular mechanisms that govern, you know, how muscle contracts and generates force and, and things like that. So uh, I did a lot of uh, training studies looking how, what the effects of muscle hypertrophy is on, on force development in skeletal muscle and, and really how, how uh, ground-based models of spaceflight, which is really a fancy way of saying that we suspended rodents upside down in a cage and looked <laughs> at, their, at their muscle function. Uh, so, so that's kind of how I got my start in muscle. So it was, it was quite fascinating. Um, Where did you do this work? In uh, Oregon State okay. on the West Coast. So... So when I was looking for a postdoc, I had an opportunity to continue the same line of work in skeletal muscle, looking at um, things like, you know, continuing the space flight work or looking at mechanisms of muscle atrophy in, uh, in certain neurological uh, diseases, um, which was interesting, but I felt like at that time I needed something different. And that's kind of how I stumbled onto cardiac muscle. One heartbeat so, away. <laughs> yeah, basically, I, I uh, and and when I first, you know, thought about, uh, I started entertaining this idea of, of uh, moving to the cardiac field. I I wasn't tremendously interested in in cardiac muscle because I didn't think, you know, it had the same uh, adaptation potential that you know skeletal muscle does. But when I started reading about how complicated and how unique the the heart is and how muscle functions within that environment, it was incredibly fascinated and it was incredibly complicated so i felt if i'm going to try and make a career out of this i could probably spend a lifetime studying this and and never be bored so how does the traditional muscle fiber in a heart muscle differ uh so first of all the the architecture of the heart is so unique um 
that if you think about, you know, most people when they think about how muscle in the heart works, how the, how the cardiac muscle contracts, they kind of think that it's this homogeneous process that, you know, you just squeeze your fist and, you know, the blood goes oozing out of the ventricles. And when you start, uh, when you start studying how the process actually takes place, you realize that it is so incredibly complex how the timing of all the different regions of the heart have to uh, uh, work together, how um, you know the heart motion is really this ringing and unringing. It's you know it's kind of like squeezing a towel, and uh, and obviously we know that disease states affects you know different aspects of this uh, mechanism. And really, every disease has its own unique signature on on how the heart works. So, so it's it's uh, the 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 cardiac muscle itself, you know, is technically made up of similar proteins, but the environment is completely different and the architecture is different. So, those are the major differences. How about the control? Well, obviously, um, the. The you know you to simplify things, skeletal muscle is kind of an all or nothing uh, mechanism where um, you know the 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 muscles are act are, are have to reach a particular threshold of activation and then they're active. With the cardiac muscle, obviously, the way that the heart has to constantly change function and, and the heart rate level constantly changes, that it's mostly uh, basically moving from one level to another. But obviously, the heart never really turns off. Uh, at least not while it's functioning. So, so that the control is completely different as well. How many how many cells, heart cells, muscle cells do you need in a petri dish for them to start beating? And uh, will they? For them to start beating. What's this? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the smallest so it, number you've seen. One, one, one really? myocyte. Yeah, you're kidding. So, so it sits there alone, going jink, jink, jink. Yeah. That, <laughs> so, so. It, so the, the techniques that we use in the lab, we, we have the capability to really isolate the function of one myocyte or several myocytes stuck together and look at the nitty gritty of you know, how, these, how these individual cells uh, develop force and, and perhaps you know, the kinetics and contraction and things like that. So things that are relevant to the in vivo function. Really, I'm so, that's, that's, that's a pretty amazing demonstration, I suppose, in the lab is to, to have a single cell in a petri dish, and it's just sitting there contracting. How does it? Does it have all this, the internal feedback mechanisms that are required for you, human physiology? I mean, if you, do you if you have the oxygen levels down low, does it start that one cell start pumping faster? Well, I mean, faster? obviously the, there are uh, limitations to every technique when you when you take uh, an isolated myocyte out of a, out of a whole heart. Um, so there's different ways to study these cells, and it really depends on what what level of complexity you're interested in. Um, so there are cells that have uh, a functional uh, calcium handling system when you can really electrically stimulate them, which is uh, you know, much more I would be in its natural environment. If you're interested in studying particular proteins that have to do with contraction and you want to control the calcium level uh, to the cell, then you can treat them with uh, certain detergents and that allows you to uh, look at the activation of the cell, different calcium environments, or in the absence or presence of different enzymes and, and so forth. So the latter is the majority of work that we do in our lab because we're really much more interested in, in the, the function of the motor proteins in the cardiac muscle. Okay. And do you, so we, we did mention that we, we weren't, you know, between uh, off air that we weren't going to cover your material so much, or we, we're going to try and use other people's examples for, <laughs> for obvious reasons. That's right, yeah. Um, just for, you know, uh, if, if, if you've noticed, I've never spoken about my work on the show, and there's reasons for this. Um, you know, it's a competitive environment. You don't necessarily want to share everything. Um, now, so how about, how about we, can, can you talk a little bit about, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing? Because it, Sure. Yeah. So uh, okay, because that'd be really cool. But I don't want to push you into uh, a corner. No, 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 no. It's fine. So, um, so basically, like I said, we we look mostly at what we call my filament proteins, which uh, are are the proteins that are responsible for the actual motor function of the the cardiac units and and how they develop force. Um, 
we're interested in in several particular proteins that are a physiologically relevant because they either get phosphorylated um, and they increase or decrease their function uh, in different conditions of of cardiac stress, for example, or uh, in a subset of proteins that are very susceptible to genetic mutations, which uh, which cause you know things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy uh, in in patients. So so these are the kind of things that cause people um, who otherwise seem healthy to you know drop dead and collapse at a young age, uh, and then you know you go back and you look at what you know what the state of their cardiac muscle was and you can identify some mutations in proteins. So things like that. So we look both at, at the physiological relevance of these proteins as well as the clinical relevance. So your work basically in terms of, I'll start with the mutagenesis and understanding the various mutants that are causing people to drop dead. By understanding the, the changes in the, in the specific genes, if you could find out what they are, correlate them to the dropping dead, you would be able to use, do personalized medicine, I suppose. And this is where having your own genome might actually save your life, right? And, you know, we had George Church on to talk about the Personal Genome Project, and a lot of people are reluctant because of the insurance plans, the insurance policies in the U.S. that if, you know, information got out, you wouldn't get insurance. I think, uh, you know, right now that's not necessarily the case anymore because nobody can be denied. Uh, although there's a lot of intricacies there, but <laughs> imagine if, if you that's, knew that's that you had a disposition to just drop dead. If if you could, you're like the that lady in V in the in the TV show, right? Where oh, by the way, in 15 years you're going to drop dead. <laughs> you can actually make those predictions if if you've seen it before. Uh, okay. Well, it's an, it's an interesting concept. Um, I don't think it's so far fetched. I don't know exactly the specificity, but we are aware of of particular cases where. We know that if if uh, if someone develops or or is born with a particular mutation, that the chances that they are going to end up in 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 severe heart failure and require a transplant are quite high. So in theory, um, it would make sense to test you know particular individuals who are at risk and maybe put them on the transplant list sooner than later. Uh, really? I don't know. I mean, we we don't. I don't. Is it I don't gradual know decay clip. or is it like instant? <laughs> Well, Sorry, I mean, I'm so, laughing. this is kind of very morbid, but yeah. So I guess those those situations are a little more rare, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, but I, I have heard of them, and uh, and it seems like you know for for some for some conditions that it, it might be a, a reasonable uh, way to proceed. And another thing you mentioned is phosphorylation. I like to translate this to my dad because he, he listens to the show. Uh, so phosphorylation is when you get a phosphate molecule attaching to your protein and those are pretty heavy right so it's a heavy modification of a protein the cells like to do this sort of thing to turn proteins on and off it's kind of, kind of like a dip switch so you're studying the effects of, of um, protein modification on their function and how this relates to disease as well or heart damage right so so physiologically um the you know the the phosphorylation for example when when the heart rate has to increase uh, put, there's the certain enzymes that are activated that that cause certain proteins to be phosphorylated, and that increases or decreases function in a particular way that's gonna that's gonna suit the new uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. And we also know that in particular diseases and heart failure, there are some proteins that tend to de to be dephosphorylated or phosphorylated, which contributes to the disease process itself depending on what the role of that protein is. So, yeah, so as you said, the, the phosphorylation of a particular protein can really alter its function. So depending on what that status is, um, you can get a totally different functional profile. Um, I'm grabbing my chest here <laughs> for the audience. I'm wincing. I've had heart surgery, so, and it was a fluke thing. So it's kind of, <laughs> this is a hard interview for me, one of the hardest I've ever done. <laughs> Uh, knowing, I, I suppose I, I, I've got a sense for, for you, know, uh, you know, the biology of the cell and you're telling me that the heart is just like um, any other biological system, that you've got proteins that can be regulated and, and modify the, uh, the function of the organ in itself is kind of really ringing home. So I apologize to the audience for my wincing and weirding out here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, as I said, it's always one heartbeat away. I um, keep repeating this. I got this is my little mantra here to sort of get through this interview. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should get a, the audible ad out of the way, and, and that will be a, a kind of way to, to get a breather. Um, 
and, and maybe we could talk a little bit, a bit more about how the, the proteins you're working on participate in the, um, in the, in the function of the heart exactly uh, within the cell. And then we'll, we'll go on to the papers because there's uh, they're really great examples of some of the uh, use of science to tackle um, major biological problems that kill millions of folk and cost uh, tens or if not hundreds of billions of dollars. So before we go, get to that, though, I'll, I'd like to thank um, Audible.com for sponsoring Futures in Biotech. They're leading provider of audiobooks with more than 70, 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For your listeners of Futures in Biotech, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service. Um, and by the way, I'm going to pull a, get a little Steve Gibson in here and, and read you an email <laughs> as part of the ad. Um, there, I got an email from Brad Eric Hollister, and he was suggesting that uh, he was asking whether or not I've ever had uh, or thought about getting Greg Bear on as a uh, potential guest. And he's a, a novelist who writes great sci-fi. Um, he's got books uh, entitled Vitals or uh, Blood Music. And while the one I found that I thought was interesting in the Audible Library is called uh, Darwin's Radio. And so this is Darwin's Radio by Greg Bear, narrated by uh, George uh, Guidall. And what it's about, um, I'll just read a little excerpt here, is in a cave in the high, high in the Alps, a renegade anthropologist discovers a f- uh, frozen Neanderthal couple with a homo sapiens baby. Meanwhile, in southern Russia, the United Nations, um, um, oh, the, the Twit crew are telling me that they love Greg Bear. <laughs> well, I'm getting distracted by pop-up windows. Okay, while in southern Russia, the United Nations in, uh, investigation of a mysterious mass grave is cut short. One of the investigators, molecular biologist uh, Kay Lang, returns home to the U.S. to learn that her theory of a human retrovirus has been retrovirus has been verified with the discovery of Shiva. So these are viruses that sit in your your uh, can sit in your DNA, and I, I think half of the human genome is actually retrovirus, right? And um, so this virus, which has slept in our DNA for hundreds of millions of years, hundred million hundreds of millions of years, is now waking up. Now the reason why I picked Darwin's radio is um, because it pairs very well with Futures in Biotech. (laughs) And Futures in Biotech episode 53, David Hostler, uh, the the episode is called Project Genome 10K, Mapping Life's Greatest Journey. He he talks about uh, the makeup of the human genome and um, how by looking back, looking at the human genome of 10,000 mammals, you can, uh, and comparing them, you can look at what's conserved and find out uh, what the original genome was of all these mammals. Uh, Mark Gerstein, episode 34, the show is called The Great Historical Document, The Human Genome. So pairing it up with Greg Bear's Darwin's Radio, which has the story of a virus that was a retrovirus that um, comes right back out. Well, it's a fun story. <laughs> and it, let go listen back to those two shows and then read the book or vice versa. And then you're going to have a... Uh, it'll, it might weird you out as well. So um, if you want to get uh, Darwin's Radio for free, you head over to audible.com forward slash biotech, sign up for the, uh, I think it's the gold account, and you get a free audiobook. Now you get to try it. I mean, this is a, a, a trial service, so you can try it. If you don't like it, you just unsubscribe and you get to keep the free book. So it's a win-win situation. So I'd like to thank uh, audible.com forward slash biotech for sponsoring futures in biotech. So um, <laughs> we can, uh, oh, by the way, in the email, uh, Brad Eric Hollister, um, he also mentioned that he would like us to do a show just like we did on NMR, uh, where we described how NMR works or MRI uh, and do a show on x-ray crystallography. So we brought in Alex McPherson. He'll be on next week. He's one of the top educators in the field of uh, x-ray crystallography. As a matter of fact, he taught Rod McKinnon uh, and another Nobel laureate, how to do X-ray crystallography, for which they won the Nobel Prize, right? So he taught two scientists, two top scientists, how to do the technique that won them the Nobel Prize. So next week on Futures in Biotech. So thanks for the idea, uh, Brad. It's really appreciated. All right, so uh, let's get back to the show. And um, we're listening to uh, Futures in Biotech, and we've got uh, Dr. Uh, Julian Stelzer uh, talking about um, the biotech of the heart. Um, 
so we were going to go and talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the proteins that you're studying um, and how uh, their modifications and mutations affect their activity. Could you describe a little bit how these proteins work? Yeah, so basically, like I said, we're uh, mostly interested in in the the motor proteins and which which mostly uh, are responsible for how much force and, and how how fast the contraction contraction of the cardiac muscle uh, how that occurs. So the the main uh, proteins that are responsible for that are, are myosin, actin, in in uh, things like myosin light chains and other accessory proteins which bind myosin. Uh, cardiac myosin binding protein C in particular is one of uh, tremendous interest lately because it's uh, been associated as as uh, the the gene that's uh, has the highest rate of mutations of the genetic mutations we we discussed earlier, so so those are basically the most of the proteins that we study in the lab on, on a regular basis. And these form a molecular machine. Yeah, so so you know basically um, this you you can think of of these proteins as as cycling along each other in in generating you know these myosin molecules kind of bind to actin and. They kind of skate along actin and and they pull themselves along, and that's how the muscles shorten and contract. <laughs> Let me see. Can you explain that again? I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to listen back. I'm still wincing. So the the you've got two fibers and an actin molecule zipping back and forth. Yeah. So we, I mean, they're they're thin filaments and thick filaments. So the thick okay. filament is is the myosin and and its accessory proteins, and the actin is the thin filament. And when these uh, mice and molecules bind to actin, they they bind tightly, and they pull themselves along the molecule, and uh, and that's how you generate force. Sort of like my fingers here going back and Basically, forth. Basically, uh, you can think All of right. it as as a rowboat. You know how how the how the kind of the boat slides along the water, and and these oars are are kind of like the the binding of the mice to the actins. And you can control these. Uh, the you can control uh, the rate and and how many uh, myosin molecules are binding to actin, which will control the force. Now, obviously, there's other mechanisms. A lot of this is driven by how much calcium is in the system, and that comes from uh, you know other components, which we're not really talking about today, which also. Uh, are largely responsible to how much force can be produced and how fast the force is produced as well. And do you think drugs uh, or uh, genetic modification uh, can can be used to control uh, in a state of uh, disease? Yeah. So, so some of the more novel uh, techniques, and 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 we'll get to uh, one of them today, is to try and control how fast this process takes place between the activation of the myosins and actins together and, and how much force can be generated. And there are some benefits to that, uh, in particular in heart failure, and um, that are largely to do with, with the fact that you're not interfering necessarily with the calcium homeostasis of the cell, which we know uh, is one of the main culprits in, in, uh, in what really ends up uh, Causing a lot of damage, which is uh, cardiac arrhythmias. How about how about we how about we tackle the first paper? Do you want to talk about Shen first? Go to yeah, the, sure. uh, Rosenbaum. Yeah, it's a good segue to that. <laughs> right. Well, it's the um, you know the premise of the paper uh, suggests what. Well, let's. I'll let you ask. <laughs> so, that one. So, so, so like like I said before, so. This particular drug that we'll be talking about is is in development now. I think it's in clinical trials, but but the idea is is somewhat different than what's been out there in the past because uh, for particular situations where the cardiac output is insufficient and uh, causes perhaps low blood pressure and and, and low peripheral performance, um, you know, generally what's been prescribed was what's what we call ionotropes, which increase the force and the rate of uh, cardiac muscle contraction, which uh, the, the payoff is that you have increased cardiac function and cardiac output. Uh, the down part of that is that you're uh, necessarily activating uh, some sort of cyclic AMP uh, 
type system, which calcium is a major component of, and you are now dysregulating potentially the calcium homeostasis as well as uh, increasing the 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 oxygen demand on the system. So so you're 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 generating more energy expenditure, which is not wow. always good in heart failure. So you're controlling calcium, but and the side effect is to control cell signaling in the cell, which then as a feedback uh, loop into the metabolism of the cell. Sounds pretty tricky. <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Not a good the, thing, right? Or sometimes so, a good thing. Right, so especially because a lot of these uh, drugs will tend to activate both sides of the coin. They, they, will, uh, they will tend to generate more force and, and faster contraction, um, but also uh, they may cause long-term desensitization. So if you use these therapies for a prolonged amount of time, you, you may... Uh, top out your effect or need more drug to generate the same effect. So let's, let's read the title. Okay, so this is for the, the people that enjoy like hardcore biotech. It's uh, Improvement of Cardiac Function by a Cardiac Myosin Activator in Conscious Dogs with Cytosolic Heart Failure. Systolic. Did I read that correctly? <laughs> I knew I didn't read it right. <laughs> oh my. All right. I should. That's why we, we haven't touched by, uh, the heart uh, in, the, in FIB yet. So, <laughs> systolic. Okay. So, improvement of cardiac function by cardiac myosin activator in conscious dogs with systolic heart failure. All right. Um, <laughs> let's turn to page one to the abstract. So, how do you want to break this down? Do you want to, uh, you want to go over the abstract? A material and sort of then sort of go through the paper and, and describe uh, uh, their their major finding. Yeah, I guess we can we can just go over the major findings and and kind of how they did the experiment. Um, sure. They, I mean, like we said, some of the pieces are not readily available or obvious because this is uh, a clinical drug. So I think the the exact mechanism of how this may be working is you know not necessarily uh, public knowledge yet. So, um, so we can go through the data and then we can take it for what it is. And uh, I think the idea itself is novel. So, you know, this could be a good future direction for research. Cool. And we could possibly have the author on, uh, the senior author on to talk about it. Sure. Um, you know, let me point out again to the audience that here's a drug that could help save one of those 300,000 lives, right? It's 300,000 lives a year that die. Uh, at a cost of $37 billion to society. Right? So th this is a major, major problem. And, you know, sometimes a simple drug which can improve outcome uh, can, you know, even if it saved half those people, you're talking about saving 150,000 lives uh, a year, which is enormous, which is incredible. You know, think about the level of death and war and think about what you can do as a scientist to get a drug out and potentially you know, counteract the numbers of deaths of the past, you know, three wars and, and just, you know, reverse that for good. I, I hate to be a, um, you know, uh, an ideologue, I suppose. <laughs> it's a, it's a, but I, you, you got to, you know, find the, 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 the strength to do some of these experiments and uh, it takes an enormous amount of work. So this drug is called Omicamtiv. That's right. Macarbil. Yeah. Macarbil. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't come up with a fancy name, like a simple name. Yeah, so so maybe you know if if this if this drug does go through, we might have to petition to change its name. You can't say that very fast. Heart smooth. <laughs> so, By the way, Mark, the, what you just talked about now, I, I think uh, I had the opportunity to spend some time, you know, in a real OR because uh, I was interested in you know human heart failure, and obviously there's no other way to get. Uh, to really understand human disease, but to study the human tissue itself. So I was fortunate enough to have a collaboration where uh, with some cardiothoracic surgeons who uh, were doing cardiac transplants, and you know we were able to get um, some some of the so some of the explanted hearts that uh, were being harvested and, and replaced with uh, with new hearts. And, uh, and, and you talked about the strength to carry out these experiments. I think that, you know, that, that definitely helped me understand how important this work is and, and why it's worth doing. Um, and, and the other thing that it really brings home is that, um, you know, that, that, that not only is this really complicated, that, you know, that the effects, the effects of long-term heart failure are really devastating, um, 
you know, when you look at what comes out of the person when, when they're being transplanted, you, you can't really believe that this thing was even pumping blood. It's, it's pretty impressive. So, so like you said, this is a very, this is a big deal. Um, and this is a huge problem. So, so these drugs are, are, uh, if, if they work, they could be really great. Well, I, I sat in a, in the ER, not in the ER, sorry, in a cardiac step down and I was there for a week and the patient across the hall had a heart transplant. And after what, five or six days, he and I were walking up and down the halls together. And, uh, this lady who was in the room beside me had an artificial heart. And while this seems like, you know, necessarily it's amazing, right? But it's not necessarily the be all end all. If, if you know, uh, you can get a drug that can just, and, and sort of an understanding of the function of the heart down to the molecular level where you can make a prediction as to where the condition of the heart really is and where it's going and then tailor uh, some, you know, personal cocktails of drugs that will stabilize that heart and add 20 years without having to do the surgery. You know, you might die of a car accident <laughs> before the end of that. So it will certainly push back the problem of the heart. Um, I, I hate to joke about it, but uh, so that's pretty, it's pretty cool. And so you, you were there taking a human heart out into, so that you could use some of the material for your, your experiments. Yeah, so we were interested in, you know, understanding what really happens to these hearts after long-term heart failure. And, um, you know, it's so obviously the long-term goal of doing something like that is to develop uh, potential uh, therapeutic drugs to target those particular areas. But there's obviously not a lot of data on the actual human heart for obvious reasons. So, uh, you know, having the opportunity to participate in a study like that really helped me understand, uh, you know, what, what are the things that really need to be done. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about uh, Omicantive, uh, I can't even pronounce it, o- o- formerly CK1827452. Yeah, All you right. can't win with either one of those names. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we touched a bit about the background already. Um, what What's the novelty and the advantage perhaps of going in this approach as opposed to the, the traditional uh, ionotrope? Type of thing. Uh, so, so the major advantage, as as uh, addressed by the authors, is that you can get increased function without uh, necessarily interfering with calcium uh, processes. And uh, another big advantage is that that you don't increase the energy expenditure, and that's obviously very important. A failing heart that is already struggling to cope with its uh, its normal duties. So, so those are the two biggest benefits that are, are kind of outlined in this paper. And, um, and uh, you, know, you know, that's basically what's, what's said in the abstract. Now, the, the, ma- the major finding uh, is, or, or the, perhaps the, the interesting mechanism of action, which is also uh, unique to this drug to date, is that uh, it doesn't necessarily increase the rate of contraction it tends to prolong the period of systolic ejection. So that would, uh, uh, so increasing the period of systolic ejection obviously would be beneficial for ejecting more blood with every heartbeat. So it and slows it, down the release right, of, of the contraction. Right, so, so basically the way the heart works is it develops pressure uh, until, you know, the, when the pressure's overcome, the valve opens and the blood gets ejected. Now that okay. obviously uh, the period when that valve is open and the blood is able to eject, you know, has to be timed correctly with the heart rate and all the other processes. So if we're able to prolong that that uh, ejection phase, then we can squeeze more of the blood out. Um, and if it doesn't cost the heart any more energy, then that's a win-win. That's amazing. So how do they find the drug? It- how do they find a drug? So I'm guessing they, these, I mean, this, this is a small molecule, I, you know, they, the structure or exactly how they uh, stumbled onto the idea, you know, I don't really know the history, but uh, I think it took extensive testing to find this particular molecule that will have the desired effect without influencing all those other things we talked about earlier that uh, might be beneficial in the short term, but might uh, be detrimental in the long term. So I'm guessing they had to test several compounds uh, until they finally settled on this one, would had you know the best effects that they wanted. Um, let's let's go let's, let's go through some of the. Uh, <laughs> I'm flipping through the paper here. Apologies, I'm not looking at the camera. Um, this is. Uh, uh, how do you want to tackle this? 
So, we, so maybe maybe we should start by yeah. Ex, so let's try and explain this this heart failure model first of all, which okay. uh, is a little bit confusing because I think you had to read some of their previous papers to understand what was going on here. That's why but, you're here. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if we're going to do this justice, but I'll, I'll do my best. So that's okay. Um, so basically, the, they you know they had these dogs and. Um, you know, d dog and, and, and pig are, are common models that people use to mimic, uh, you know, human heart function. And basically what they wanted to do was to induce some sort of damage. So they, they induce several ways of, of damage that are going to try and mimic the human heart failure condition. And then they treated uh, these animals with their drug uh, in a dose-dependent fashion, uh, for I believe up to 72 hours of using infusion. So there's a couple models here. One of them is an infarction model and the other one is a model which is uh, aortic banding which is designed to create hypertrophy in the ventricle mm -hmm. which is one of the hallmarks of, of what happens to the heart when it begins to fail. And then they compounded those effects by, uh, by ventricular pacing which is really pacing the heart out of rhythm uh, so, you know, the heart is normally paced to the atria, so they're pacing the, the, the cardiac muscle through the ventricle, uh, exacerbating the, the effects of, of the infarction in the, the aortic banding model. Okay, let me translate that into English. <laughs> uh, I, I understand infarction. So they basically put a clot, sort of like a... Um, so what like they a, did was to, they, 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 tied, they tied a, a coronary vessel right? And that, that causes some of the cardiac tissue to become ischemic. And it's just like uh, a, a arterial sclerosis, right? Like a clot. In a... No, it's, it's not a clot. It's, it's literally, uh, you they know, they tied it, but that yeah. imitates a clot. It's well, a I mean, the, the, the important, the importance, the important thing is that the end result is, is that you have basically, uh, a, a piece of scarred tissue that okay. essentially is no longer contracting. Okay. Within the, within the heart itself, and what was the other method? So the other method was to tie off um, uh, an aortic uh, or or the I mean they call it aortic stenosis. Basically, what you're trying to induce is is pressure overload hypertrophy. So you're you're causing the 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 ventricular wall to to hypertrophy. Okay. In a nutshell, they just wanted to really cause. Uh, some long-term heart dysfunction to try and mimic, uh, you know, an end-stage heart patient the best they could. Sure. And they use dogs because they're the right size, they're easy to work with in the ER? Uh, well, I mean, if you look at the basal heart rate, it's relatively close to what a human might be, at least a, a dog that size. And, um, you know, there are some advantages to using dogs uh, over pigs, for example, because, uh, they're they're able to train them to you know be more uh, uh, or or to lay still while they're trying to make some of the more intricate measurements, so it doesn't interfere. Uh, okay. But usually, those are the two two biggest animal models that are mostly representative of perhaps the human heart function. And they do this in conscious dogs. Uh, yeah, so obviously the surgeries are are done under anesthesia, but uh, but they they implant uh, several devices that are able to monitor cardiac function. And basically, they're able to monitor. So then, they're able to study these animals in a conscious state while these uh, while these uh, instruments are implanted in the animal. Mm -hmm. So they've they've now replicated um, long term heart failure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there there are differences to different types of heart failure, different animal models versus others, but, but I think generally speaking, you know, they, they, they produce some of the hallmarks of heart failure, uh, including uh, hypertrophy and, and changes in, uh, in diastolic pressure and so forth. Okay, I'm, I'm looking. So the, the effects of Omer Camptiv Microbeer 24 hours after infusion in conscious dogs with LE, uh, LVH, which, uh, which is uh, uh, le left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is uh, yeah, tie, tying tying off a blood vessel to increase right. the pressure in the presence uh, of uh, SHF. So so the ASH, the ASH, SHF is uh, what they induced 
they call that systolic heart failure, and they induce that with with their uh, uh, ventricular pacing model, essentially to to exacerbate the the regular uh, heart failure they they induced in the dogs to start with. And it says the improved cardiac performance was accomp- uh, accompanied by a decrease in heart rate and LV and uh, di- diastolic pressure, whereas the MVO2 remained unchanged. So the molecular oxygen was unchanged? Right. So, so the, one of the biggest things that they, they tried to uh, uh, put across with, with this drug is that really that you can get these beneficial effects in, in, in cardiac muscle function and heart function without increasing the energy cost of, of these processes. So, um, so they, they view this as one of the, uh, of the best benefits of this drug. That's amazing. So how long is this drug, how far is this drug away from uh, clinical trials? They've got it working in dogs. So um, I believe Is it a well-known drug in terms of tox? Uh, so I believe it's phase, I mean, it's currently in clinical trials. Uh, I believe it's phase two. Um, I mean, they, they, you know, I think this might be one of the first uh, real studies uh, that have been published. A lot of this stuff has been published either in abstract form or presentations and meetings. So uh, I think there's a lot, a lot of the human stuff is still out there um, being tested right now. But based on this uh, study, it looks like it, it does show some promise. That's pretty amazing. So this is a great example. So again, if people want to go look at the abstract, they can go to PubMed, they can Google PubMed, and they can look at uh, the article that's entitled Improvement of Cardiac Function by Cardiac Myosin Activator in Conscious Dogs with Systolic Heart Failure. I, I, we can put a link to that in the, in the show notes. I think that'd be good. By Stephen F. Vatner. Do you, do you, do you want to, is like, did I, 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 I think I get it. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's why I've had a hard time with the, the, the cardiac stuff, man. So, um, but it's really cool because the implications is if you can make a drug that can improve heart function without, you know, having any kind of other physiological effects on the heart, uh, se- seems outstanding because you're going to save, as I said, 150,000 lives plus a year, maybe that's just in the U.S. alone, right? So potentially a million people a year you'd be saving. Do you want to you want to talk a little bit about the second paper? Sure. So I, I think as a caveat, we should obviously mention that um, you know one of the things that you learn quite quickly when you start looking at, at clinical data is that often uh, patients are uh, are taking you know multiple drugs at the same time, often having opposite effects on on heart function. So it's it's uh, you know animal studies are much more controlled in that way that you can uh, you can see you know the effect you might uh, envision from your drug more readily whereas in in human patients uh, you know the the treatment with the same drug might not elicit as a as a powerful response depending on what you know the the patient is taking at the same time so. Uh, so I, I think as in terms of proof of concept, this is very nice, um, but obviously we have to wait for the human studies to come out uh, before sure. we see it, how effective the drug is. Um, so yeah, so we can talk about the second paper. I thought we would, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about mice and uh, the motor function and, and how you can directly target it. Uh, so obviously every heart failure model is different. You can't you know, treat a heart failure patient with the same drug, depending on what, you know, what the need is. So, uh, do you want to introduce the second paper? Sure. We can- <laughs> well, I like <laughs> when you emailed it to me, uh, what, at 1130 last night, I, <laughs> I thought it was really cool. Um, and I thought it was cool because, well, even though I don't think this is going to hit the market anytime soon, I think it's pretty wild that instead of doing heart surgery, you can just give a person a virus and that goes into their heart and it fixes their heart. Right, so sort of gene therapy attacking the heart. If, if if I understood the paper correctly, I mean, I when I read it for yeah, the first time, so, I read so, it this- so I think uh, you know that one of the reasons why uh, this is interesting to look at, just because it's a it's a completely different approach, and it actually goes at the problem from the opposite end of of the first paper. Now, um, now obviously in this particular paper, they were using uh, adenovirus constructs, and usually those are uh, you know, thought to have a few more I mean, inflammatory issues that might not make him the best 
um, the best target for for human gene therapy. But uh, the idea was really to test, you know, if if this can be done in an animal model to to see again more of a, as a proof of concept uh, that this really is a a good uh, a good gene to target for this particular uh, heart failure. Sure. L let me read the title. Let me give it a try because this is kind of funny. People are, you know, <laughs> I know some people are going to be laughing. Uh, targeted circa 2A gene expression identifies molecular mechanism therapeutic target for a uh, <laughs> a, arith a arithmogenic, yeah. arithmogenic cardiac alternins. So I read this to my brother in law. He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you'll figure it out too. So <laughs> I didn't. I tried. I didn't. Targeted circa 2A gene expression identifies molecular mechanism and therapeutic target for arrhythmogenic cardiac alternins. Um, people should, if they go to PubMed, right, and just Google PubMed, go and then enter David S. Rosenbaum, R O S E N B A U M, and they'll find it. It, it came out in 2009, right? So. You want to you want to give a brief uh yeah let's let's give a, a, so, a brief outline of what what the problem is before we dive into the paper um sure. so so and we talked a little bit more about you know before about what what the end result is and and how you know calcium affects muscle contraction but uh you know the the whole uh cascade where where calcium is is constantly being introduced and taken out of the cells um to to drive contraction and, and and slow it down is really governed by a you know a very complex network of of uh, calcium handling proteins. So so just briefly to give a, a very very small overview, uh, the major players are um, in, in the calcium uh, handling cascade is a protein called ryanidine which is responsible for releasing the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum where it's stored. And then that calcium... Okay, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> sarcoplasmic reticulum is a compartment within the cell that rep represents the endoplasmic reticulum, right, of the regular cell. So it's this place where calcium is stored inside the cell and can get spat out by the cell. So sarcoplasmic... Right. That, so, that would so, circa okay, cool. So, so because, because muscle contraction is really driven by, by calcium, it's kind of the beginning of the cascade, so the amount of calcium that's available to the cells has to be very tightly regulated uh, mm -hmm. because too much calcium can lead to arrhythmias uh, and too little calcium can, can lead to uh, you know, a deficit in force generation. So ryanidine is really how the, the, the calcium is, is released into the cytosol and, and, and becomes available to the myofilaments, which we talked about earlier. And then that calcium has to be uh, sequestered back into the SR and uh, that is done through a, the protein, which is the target of this study, which is circa 2A. And that protein is also uh, inhibited uh, by a protein called phospholamban, which in, when it's in its dephosphorylated form, and it uh, promotes circa activity when it's phosphorylated. So again, okay, there's... Let me, <laughs> let, me, let me break this down. So circa 2A uh, is a pump that pumps calcium back into the cell. Right, and then that one circa two A is re regulated by a phosphatase. Now, a phosphatase is an enzyme that removes that little phosphate group from that's attached to proteins. Henceforth, there's like a dip switch mechanism that regulates the pump that's sucking calcium back into the cell. Right. So, so when the when the heart rate increases or in conditions of of cardiac stress, there needs to be more calcium released into the system, and that calcium has to be taken out faster to. Uh, to stay, uh, so the heart stays in rhythm. So, okay. so in a nutshell, that that's the cascade. And now, in heart failure, it is known that uh, certain aspects of this cascade could be altered. Uh, primarily, that uh, the the ryanidine receptor, which is responsible for releasing the calcium into the cell, uh, becomes dysregulated and, and tends to release more calcium than necessary. They they call that a, a ryanidine leak. And then there's also uh, a, a dysregulation in, in the in the mechanism that reuptakes the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the number of circa receptors decreases, and the protein that's kind of the circa gatekeeper, the phospholamban, uh, also uh, tends to stay in its uh, inhibitory form. Uh, that way, not allowing the calcium to be reuptaked. Reuptake, reuptake as much. <laughs> Sorry, so, re taken up. Re is there a word? Re reuptake. 
reuptaken. I don't know if that's a word. Let's yeah, just say that is a word. We make up words in bio. So it's okay. <laughs> plenty of words. So let me, I, I, and I just had a, an epiphany, I think. So the mm -hmm. sarcoplasmic reticulum, that compartment that holds the calcium, is not ejecting the calcium outside the cell, but within the rest of the cell. So it's like having a, um, a sponge inside a cell that holds calcium and then it's squeezing it, letting the calcium out and then got little channels that allow it to suck back into that sarcoplasmic reticulum. But all the calcium stays within the cell. And that Correct. calcium is what drives the, the myosin motors, the molecular machines that uh, contract and release. Correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is cool. I, I, I took plant fizz. Does it, does it, does it, is it apparent plant, that plants plant do this also? That's great. No, no, no. I took um, <laughs> and my, my undergraduate requirement physiology was uh, accomplished by doing plant physiology. Oh, but uh, I did some plant biotech. Yeah, right. So that's, that's another reason why I've avoided this. So, but, so okay. So this, we've got it. Um, a, is it a channel that's the, yes. the circuit well, way? It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a pump. It's a regulated pump. Okay. And you need yeah. this pump to clear out the calcium so that the, the heart can stay in rhythm. Right. And what did these guys do? How did they, how did they change the function of this pump to so, test whether so or not it could be used? Or so, so basically, what they what they tried to do is is increase the expression of circa, and and the effect of that is going to be that that you can reuptake uh, more calcium back into the cell. So we know that uh, having an abundance of calcium uh, of cytosolic calcium is one of the triggers for arrhythmias, which uh, is really at the end of the day what what ends up doing most people in. Uh, mm -hmm. It, you know, in, in these conditions. So, so what they were able to do is show that um, that they can increase this expression uh, homogeneously. Or make in more the, of it. To you know, increase expression means to make more of the protein. They can engineer. Right. So, okay. uh, yeah. So uh, the the other thing that um, that they do mention in the paper, and it's it's also important to note that that just making more of this is not going to help if you're not actually getting it to the right spots in the heart. Uh, we said that the expression of these proteins and their function is uh, heterogeneous in the heart. That means that mm -hmm. you may have more uh, more protein or less protein in different regions, and the kinetics of, of those proteins may work differently. So one of the things they were able to accomplish is that they were able to, um, to express these proteins uh, in a homogeneous way, so they're, they're increased um, in the correct orientation. Wow. So they used adenovirus, which is a, it's right. a virus that's pretty easy. So I mean, it's a common virus that we can engineer in the lab um, that you can just pop a gene in, pop a gene out. So they put circa 2A under the control of a promoter. Is it a heart based promoter? Is that how they, or did they actually attach GFP, a green fluorescent protein, so they right. could track so I think, it? I think that's how they were able to visualize the expression. So they did this in guinea pig hearts. So they infected guinea pig hearts, or did they infect a guinea pig and the, the guinea pig hearts were targeted because of the, uh, the, the promoter? No, I, I, think, I think they were able to actually, uh, I, I think they got local expression by really inserting, inserting these injections, you know, right into the blood vessels or, or into the cord, uh, I believe right into the ventricle. It says here, uh, cytomegalovirus-driven expression cassette. So they used a uber viral promoter switch to to make the uh, the protein. So they really cranked up the the, <laughs> the circuit two A. Right. So um, actually, they they show that the the expression or the increased expression they got was not uh, not much greater than thirty or forty percent. But this was enough um, to really show that that they're able to. Uh, to uh, get the calcium back into the cell. And what they were really interested in doing is seeing what one of the main things that they, uh, that they say causes these, uh, these arrhythmias is that uh, there is, uh, uh, when the heart rate exceeds the capability of the cardiac myocyte to cycle calcium. So this typically happens at uh, high workloads, which are very heart, very, uh, very high heart rates. So, yeah, I think they show a couple figures where they they're able to really control these effects uh, of of the calcium uh, reuptake up to very very high heart rates, which is um, you know important physiologically. So they basically made a super heart. 
a heart that could take up calcium as fast as needed, even an increased heart rate that was beyond the amount of uptake, traditional uptake. Right. And then, or is that and then only, in, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. What'd you say? Is this only in disease states that the heart can't handle the calcium reuptake? So or that's this, one of the, yeah, so I mean that's one of the mechanisms by which uh, you know when the when when the uh, the expression levels of these proteins that are responsible for releasing the calcium and reuptaking it are disrupted, then then you're much more susceptible to uh, an arrhythmia, especially at higher heart rates when um, you know the 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 speed of the process uh, has to go up a lot, so. So I think what they were able to show that they're they are able to specifically target this particular pathway without interfering with other electrophysiology uh, uh, parameters that that could uh, that could be important. So this uh, so Rosenbaum basically showed that this protein, if possibly targeted with a drug that could activate it, make it more you know an agonist, make it stronger. Uh, could actually be uh, a valuable drug target uh, that if you improve calcium reuptake through circa 2A, you're going to improve your the heart's ability to withstand uh, higher blood, uh, blood pressure and, and heart rate? Well, yeah. So so if if you were able to increase the expression of, those, of this protein, you will be able to clear uh, cytosolic calcium uh, more efficiently and that would remove one of the main culprits of of uh, of arrhythmia. So you do it that way, rather. So you you would say going with the gene therapy in the heart would be the better way to go than to give with a, to to go with a pharmacological drug. I, I'm just asking. I, I don't know either way. Uh, I don't. I mean, I I don't really know. I think I I think this particular target is. Uh, I think they're attempting it both ways, uh, and also because of the the potential inflammatory effects of this particular uh, virus. Uh, I think it's also being developed in uh, adeno-associated virus or, or AAV, which I know to be less toxic in humans. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe they're also trying to develop uh, a drug uh, similar to the, the first drug we talked about that could be either infused or taken orally. So, what, what, um, a drug you'd be on for life is the gene expression maintained? Do you think, but with some of these uh, gene therapy approaches, do you think the, the expression could be maintained for thirty years? Uh, I don't know. Well, th this particular uh, this particular study, maybe not. But I think they have shown that with other uh, virus deliveries, that you get stable expression for years. So, wow. so it is a viable it is a viable approach. Okay. <laughs> well, I think it's pretty amazing. I think it's really amazing. I, I think uh, these are two really good examples, right, of the development of a, a novel drug uh, that can um, really improve physiological outcome and function of the heart and alternatively using gene therapy. And they did it on, on, on Chinese hamster hearts. What was that? Did I, is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it worked. I mean, they were able to create a virus, engineer a virus that could go into the heart or even if they infused it into the heart, um, was able to improve outcome. That's amazing. Uh, so there, there may come a day where rather than have, uh, you know, a new heart valve put in, you'd be able to just uh, get, get a syringe and get infused with a, with a virus, right? Yeah, the the yeah, true that, biotech of the heart. That's right. So I, I think that that could be a direction that the field is heading. Oh, cool, because that really hurt. <laughs> I'm going to my chest here. It really hurts. I got five weeks of, I almost, my brother came over to the house and cracked a joke and I was laughing and my sternum was all falling apart. <laughs> <I'm> like, oh. <laughs> that little baby grabbed, my son was born the same, two days after. He was grabbing all my little zipper. <laughs> it's, it's really hardcore. I'm losing listeners right now as I speak. Like, like you're scaring <laughs> the audience. <laughs> Hey, so, no, that's, this is why it's amazing. It's important. This is really, really important work. And I really appreciate you coming on to give us uh, some examples of, of, some, of the, and, uh, some, of the, some of this work. And I, I really appreciate the audience hanging through to the end, those that, that did, um, because it was really hardcore. But it's, it's a first look for futures in biotech into um, the biotechnology of the heart. Um, so I, I, I really thank you for coming on. And so what we'll do is we'll... Uh, Try and contact some of these uh, top-notch guys, and and get them to uh, talk about their work and how they came across uh, 
uh, some of these uh, new approaches and what they're doing and uh, how it's going. It'd be really great to uh, to have you co-host some of those shows. And we'll, uh, you know, maybe you could help, you know, bring it down from their level to your level, and then I can take it from your level and bring. It down. <laughs> Although yeah, you're up at their level, to. you're just younger. That's all. <laughs> So, so we also have to have to say that you know neither you or I have any uh, stock or, or any interest in these companies per se. So, <laughs> whatever we're promoting here today is strictly for the science. Yeah, what what companies produce these? Um, well, this is published in the journal Circulation, the fr- uh, paper one by Shen Al is in Circulation Heart Failure. We'll provide a link, and the other one was in Circulation Arrhythmia and Electrophysiology, and that's by Cutler Al. 2009. The other one was 2010. So um, yeah, we didn't even mention the companies. I don't know. And I, I don't think we have to worry about it. This is editorial <laughs> perspective. <laughs> We're asking That's for right. your opinion. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So uh, more heart to come, more biotech of the heart. As I said, one heartbeat away, right? Uh, from death. So it, this is, if you're going to do some work in the area of biotech, um, you could have a serious impact. And uh, it's the number one uh, human frailty, right? It kills the most people. It's heart disease one in five. Um, so <laughs> that, thanks a lot for coming on, uh, Julian. All right, th- thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. Um, we, I'd like to also thank uh, Burke McQuinn for handling the audio video boards today and uh, the recordings. Thank you, Burke. Um, I'd also like to welcome our new producer, Tony Wang, who has been an editor for several years at uh, This Week in Tech. Uh, He's taking on some additional responsibilities, and one of them is going to be uh, producing Futures in Biotech. So he's going to be doing a lot of the work over at Petaluma to help the show out. So uh, welcome on board, uh, Tony, and uh, I appreciate you helping out with the show. Uh, I'd also like to thank the team that made this possible, uh, that made this possible, Leo Laporte, Dane Golden, Eric Lanigan, Frédéric Louis and the rest of the team in Petaluma, California. Lastly, I'd like to thank Phil Peltzi and Will Hall for the opening and closing themes. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can reach me at futuresinbiotech.com. That's futuresinbiotech.com. For Futures in Biotech, I'm Mark Peltier.